This bike build project started in the middle of December 2018, when I bought this frame set. In the time leading up to that, I've been looking around on the internet occasionally for a frame set that was off-road capable, had proper tire clearance, was proven quality, featured rack mounts and looked good. I suddenly realized that the Nina RLT9 RDO had all the features I was looking for in an adventure bike for use as my primary or potentially only bike, and so this is the bike build of the quirkiest Nina RLT9 RDO that you will have ever seen. By the point I bought the frame set, I already owned a Yolio carbon wheel set, and so I purchased another customized tubeless ready wheel set off of them. For various reasons, I was in possession of the complete wheel set, not before the end of April 2019. This was fine because it was mostly winter time, but more important is that I ended up taking all of these months to frequently research, revisit and order all the various componentry for the bike build. Furthermore, during this time I sold both my road bike and mountain bike because I hardly rode them anymore, which also helped to fund a part of this bike. After I had all the components ready, I started building the bike over the course of 5 days, starting with the wheels. Setting up the wheels tubeless was pretty easy and I did not require any tire levers. I really love that these wheels don't require rim tape because that eliminates the possibility of a leaking rim, which is often the reason for a failing or leaking tubeless setup. I was not able to seat the tires without sealant which I'm sure was partly due to the fact that I bought these tires used and at least one tire had a hole in it that needed to be sealed. Alert Canyon fans will know that these Gumwall Schwalbe G1 Byte tubeless easy tires actually cannot be bought off the shelf, for they are a custom product developed by these two companies and they only come with new Canyon gravel bikes. One owner of such sold these tires online, which I happily acquired for a good price. The wheels have been equipped with the new Shimano XDR brake rotors in 160mm both front and rear, and I upgraded the DT Swiss Freehub from 18 teeth to 36 teeth. I would have preferred a 180mm rotor in the front, in order to have more brake force where it's needed. However, this is only possible by using a post mount brake caliper with a fairly unsightly adapter. There were a lot of parts and standards that I have had never worked with before. One such was SRAM components, and the cassette installation ended up being the first major challenge I had to overcome. The cassette did not seat properly on the hub when I thought I had torqued it down, but really because the XD cassette type has quite high internal friction, all it took was more torque and then the cassette seated properly on the hub. 40 newton meters is a lot after all, and it was my exacerbated cautiousness that cost me the better part of two frustrated late night hours, which aren't shown in the time lapse footage. As one of the few things I accomplished before I started building the bike was installing the crown race, which is the metal shim that creates the contact point between the fork crown and the bottom headset bearing. I found a conveniently sized PVC pipe at my local hardware store with 50mm outer and 46mm inner diameter, so all it took was one buck fifty and a good chunk of hammering until the crown race sat perfectly flush with the fork crown. I cut down the handlebars from 780mm down to a generous 720mm, which certainly is still very wide for a narrow-shouldered person like me. As I think the saying goes, measure thrice, cut once. After installing fork, stem and handlebars, I adjusted the derailleur hanger with a derailleur hanger alignment tool. The hanger only needed a very minor adjustment to ensure best possible shifting performance. Next I installed the wheels manufacturing bottom bracket which features two aluminum cups that thread together and converts the press fit 30 to a 24mm spindle. The cups had a snug fit and could be pushed in by hand, hence this installation was extremely easy 
and I was able to torque it down using only one bottom bracket tool. I had previously routed the rear brake hose through the frame with the help of the little red hose connector that came with my RockShox reverb, which I sold shortly thereafter. As you might be wondering about the brakes, it is no problem to mix flat mount brake calipers with mountain bike brake levers. The bleeding procedure was straightforward and I find it much easier than bleeding SRAM brakes. Also, the use of corrosive and water absorbing DOT fluid in SRAM brakes is why I'm probably never using SRAM brakes again. There was never one detailed vision of this bike build that I set out to create. In fact, just hours before I purchased the frame set, I didn't even know I was going to buy a frame set anytime soon. Rather, the individual components chosen developed and changed over time. At first, I thought this was going to be another flat bar gravel bike with a 2 by Shimano drivetrain, just like my commuter bike, a modified entry-level Canyon Fitness bike. But with new thoughts and arguments, my ideas changed, and I am glad I took my time in making these individual decisions. As you can tell, being able to use SRAM Eagle and furthermore mix the SRAM drivetrain with Shimano brakes is something only the use of flat handbars allows. The primary reasons, however, for why I opted for a mountain bike handlebar setup is that I have had trouble finding a good fit with the long reach drop handlebars necessarily create, and I also feel much safer riding through rough terrain with flat handlebars. The Shimano 105 crankset I used comes from the Canyon commuter. I have installed a narrow wide oval chain ring by Absolute Black. Though I have never used ovalized chain rings before, I was easily convinced by this concept, smoothing the pedal stroke to increase efficiency and grip, and possibly gain in comfort. With 38 teeth, it is the smallest oval chain ring you can buy for this crankset, and allows me to ride up even the steepest sections with a reasonable cadence. I live in a very hilly area and generally do not pedal when I'm already going downhill fast, so the 3810 high gear, which is equivalent to a 5013, provides plenty high end range for me. The chain line is ideal in this setup, with the chain being most straight in the middle of the cassette. The crankset also features a first generation stages power meter I have used since 2013. This power meter, although not without its flaws, has worked well overall and I am happy to continue using it to pace efforts and get accurate data about exercise intensity. That being said, overlies chain rings do interfere with power meter accuracy and I expect the stages to consistently read a couple percent higher than actual power. For shortening the steerer tube, I did not use a saw guide, but instead helped myself with tape and a clamp. I had already done a test cut before, and my second cut was a lot straighter. Carbon dust is toxic, and I did not shy away from protecting myself vigorously. Besides cutting outside with the gloves, I protected my breathing holes with a towel and was also wearing goggles. When cutting carbon with a regular 32 tooth steel saw, it is important to keep in mind that the blades blunt extremely quickly. After only half the steerer tube, this small saw blade is blunt, and hence I swapped it for a new one to ensure a clean and straight cut. The frame set came with an expansion plug, but instead I'm using a plug by Pro that I can insert independently of where the steerer tube is cut allowing me to place the plug alongside the whole length of where the stem clamps, which is especially helpful in the beginning when I keep the steerer tube extra long. In case you are wondering about any of the components, I've put all the details in the description. Naturally, this frame is not designed to run SRAM Eagle, which is a 12-speed mountain bike drivetrain. In setting up the derailleur, I encountered the second challenge that I had to overcome, in shifting to the highest gear, the derailleur would basically hit itself and have trouble shifting. Specifically, the derailleur cage would make contact with a plastic arm that routes the shifter cable. 
This is because the derailleur is generally too close to the cassette, because the derailleur hanger is much closer to the cassette than on mountain bikes. The only real solution to this problem is to bring the derailleur outwards, and so I ended up grinding a 1.3mm thick washer that I had laying around to the proportions I needed. This is only a bodge and not a perfect solution, unfortunately, because torque down to the 10 to 12 newton meters as recommended has the derailleur not swing freely anymore, which isn't a big issue though, because the derailleur itself does not swing in normal operation. What is also remarkable about this setup is how close the chain runs along the inside of the derailleur hanger in the smallest sprocket. With less than a millimeter of space I could imagine the chain rubbing against the hanger, but the hanger could be sanded down should that problem ever come up. Finally, there were only pedals, seat post, saddle and bottle cage left to mount. Regarding the pedals, I am using the Catalyst flat pedals invented by Pedaling Innovations on all bikes for many reasons. Mainly, these pedals are large enough to allow for a central positioning of the feet over the pedal, meaning they are mid-foot pedals. This creates a pedaling motion more like squatting rather than sprinting relaxing the calf and allowing better actuation of the glutes. Furthermore, I only wear barefoot shoes and riding flat pedals allows me to ride bikes with them, also allowing for easy off-the-bike walking or hiking. Fellow Kenyan fans will also recognize the seat post, which is a carbon suspension seat post that diminishes road vibration through a spring leaf design. This seat post was invented by Canyon and Ergon and does not come with much of a weight penalty at all. However, it does come with a hefty price of 250 euros. Not least because I wasn't even sure if I needed a straight seat post or one with setback, I ended up buying a Chinese replica of such seat post, which are available for under 40 euros on AliExpress. I have used the seat post already and am happy with how it performs. It is fairly well built, but mine came undersize. Luckily, the design of this seat post allows for a plastic spacer to be sandwiched between the carbon leaves to bring it up to a proper diameter. I hadn't yet found my ideal saddle, so I put a lot of research and thinking time into choosing the saddle. I opted for the Prologo Dimension NDR which is the mountain bike version of the regular and highly praised short-nosed Prologo Dimension that features 3 mils of additional padding. I never understood why conventional saddles have these super long noses that I cannot sit on comfortably anyway. And also I knew that I needed a cutout in the middle of the saddle in order to relieve pressure on the soft tissue. Hence I felt this model was the right choice. Featuring titanium rails, it is also decently light at 200 grams. Speaking of weight, the finished bike as shown comes in at exactly 9 kilograms. If we left out the computer mount, bottle cage, bell and the pedals which alone weigh half a kilogram, the weight would be 8.4 kilograms. Out of sheer curiosity about what proportions make up a bike in weight, I've created a detailed chart that you can find in the description. In case you think this bike does not deserve the title of the quirkiest gravel bike, wait for the bike touring setup. It is going to feature the amazing and light titanium rear rack by Tubus and clip-on aero bars. Naturally, I've ridden this bike quite a bit since and it is quite amazing. I'm very happy with all the components and even thrilled by some and I'm very satisfied with how the bike performs overall. Let me know what you think and if you would like to see a review in the comment section below. Thanks for watching.